Good afternoon and welcome to the New York State Museum's virtual summer programming. I'm Katherine Weller, Director of Education, and today I'm very excited to have senior historian Ashley Hopkins Fenton, as well as interpretive programs coordinator for the Office of Parks and Recreation and Historic Preser Preservation, Kirsten Gustafson. They are joining us today to talk about the reform costume of the 19th century. Now, our programming for the month of August is looking at commemorating the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Now, this did not give all women the right to vote, but it did make it illegal to not allow women the right to vote because of their sex, or to let anyone, or not let anyone have the right to vote because of their sex. During the month, we'll have more programming, so we welcome you to come back to our Facebook page or our YouTube page, as well as our um, portal to online educational resources, and that is at nysm.nyseb.gov slash resources. We also have a page talking about suffrage in New York as well as in the rest of the country, and that page is at nysm.nyseb.gov slash v-o-t-e-s dash f-o-r dash w-o-m-e-n or votes for women. On that page, you can find coloring sheets, other programming that we have, as well as our Votes for Women lesson plan. And this lesson, actually, we have a lesson specifically for this cause, Express Yourself Using Clothing to Send a Message. So thank you for joining us. And Ashley, could you tell us a little bit more about the reform costume? Uh, well, before we start talking specifically about the reform costume, um, we're going to talk about how the reform costume fit into the women's rights movement. Um, we'll be talking a lot about uh, around the year 1851. Um, but before that, in 1848, things were happening in New York State. In April of 1848, New York was the first state to pass the Married Women's Property Act, which gave women the right to vote even after they married, so their property didn't transfer directly from their father to their husband. Um, also in 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and a group of other men and women in Seneca Falls decided that it was time to really talk about women's rights and to hold a convention. Uh, so they held a convention in Seneca Falls uh, where they discussed the ways that women were uh, being denied their rights in the home, in the church, in the professions, in schools. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton really thought about these problems and she thought that the way to fix them was through getting the vote. So she also added the right to elect a franchise, the right to vote. Um, so when we talk about dress reform and women's rights in the 19th century, we're not just talking about the right to vote, we're talking about a whole number of different issues. The fact that women couldn't go to work, um, they couldn't have access to professions, they couldn't get as much education as men. Uh, and I did bring with me, uh, this is the cover of the convention report from that Seneca Falls Convention, and also the table on which the Declaration of Sentiments was drafted. The Declaration of Sentiments was the document that they organized all the accounts for the convention. And it begins, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. So Kirsten's going to talk a little bit about fashionable dress for women in the 1850s. here both that myself and that Ashley are wearing. My dress represents the standard uh, kind of mainstream fashionable uh, costume that was available to particularly women of the upper middle classes and, and the upper classes, although mine's a little bit more uh, middle class. And Ashley has a gown that is made of the same fabric and with the same decorative details, but in the reform dress. So first of all, one of the useful things here is to talk about where this silhouette fits into the grand array of Victorian era costumes, uh, because of course, uh, they're easy to get mixed up on, and just like today, styles changed about every 10 years. So I have brought a, uh, a timeline, essentially, of women's fashion, and it kind of helps us to give a good idea of why uh, we needed reform dress at this point. We're right here, here's 1837, and down on the other corner, right here is 1850. And you can see that gowns have become extremely tight through the bodice, 
and very long, hitting the floor for most, uh, for most women and for most fashionable uh, applications. So it becomes very restrictive. It becomes very difficult to move in. Uh, and, and a lot of us think about, well, you know, I wore a wedding dress and it was hung to the floor and it was like, but think about trying to go about your daily duty. Uh, women were expected to be the managers of childcare, the managers of just functioning in daily life, cooking, all those things that you need your hands available for. When your hemline comes all the way to the floor and you need to carry a baby, and well now you've got something else, you've got a candle, you've got to go, and now you need to go upstairs. Well the fact is when your skirt is hung to the floor, all of a sudden you're tripping and stumbling on your way up the stairs because you don't have a hand to pick it up and get it out of the way. Women, uh, the fas or fashionable women are expected to be able to keep their hands free and daintily move their skirts up uh, as needed to go over a curb to go over, uh, to step into a carriage, to go up a stair. And we do those things repeatedly, every day. And so this became very cumbersome. There were a lot of drawbacks to the costume. It's heavy, uh, it's actually restrictive. This in the shoulders. This is a time period when we actually lower the shoulder seam. And so I can't lift my arms above here, which makes it really hard to get things off the top of the shelf. So there were all sorts of ways in which this began to challenge women in their daily lives. The problem is that the, they couldn't simply drop it in most cases. They didn't feel empowered to do so because there is such a power that goes along with beauty and goes along with meeting fashionable standards. Especially for women at that point in time. In the 19th century, uh, appearance is one of the major ways in which they are judged uh, for their value in society. So there's a lot of incentive to continue to keep up this clothing. I brought some other illustrations of the silhouette that you can have a, a better look specifically at this time period. Here again, you see these hemlines come right to the floor. You see these bodices that come in very close along the torso. And keeping in mind, we wear our clothes very tightly frequently now, but we wear a lot of knit clothing, which is stretchy. We wear a lot of leggings. We wear a lot of things that allow us to move. These are woven clothes that don't stretch. And so that I don't, I, again, I can't lift my arms. I can't bend and reach in the same way that tight clothing today might allow us to do. I have one more illustration of the fashionable silhouette, fully clothed, that gives an idea of, of that silhouette. I like this one because there's a lot more contrast, even though it's not as colorful. But it really gives you a sense of all that's involved. Now, when you look at this dome skirt, it's hard for us to realize now all that goes into generating this fantastic silhouette. A lot of us watch uh, television and we see things. My kids watch Sophia, and Sophia, uh, Princess Sophia has this fantastic dome skirt and it bells along with her and it seems to have its own shape. Um, it actually takes a lot of structure to build this shape. There can be anywhere from three to 10 layers to get to this size and shape. And they have a lot of weight. They actually put a lot of pressure down on your abdomen and can uh, put a lot of uh, weight. They can cause uh, you know, red marks and things that, that are indi indicative of your body kind of going, oh, this is a little much for me. Uh, so this is part, of, this costume is actually part of a program series that I frequently give um, known as the Underwear series, Wear, W-H-E-R-E, -E, Wear. Uh, so part of that series often involves me uh, giving you a look at what's underneath this. And so today I'm going to give you a, a look at some of the layers that are underneath this. This is, can take, I can take about 45 minutes or an hour showing you every individual layer, but I'm not going to make you stay here and do that today. Um, but I am going to give you a look at the corset and the chemise that are underneath here. So if you give me just a moment, I will eliminate the outer layer. Now, in this time period, the bodice and the skirt are made in two separate pieces. Mine are hooked together, so we're going to see if I am able to get them apart. I might have to call my assistants, who came magically. <laughs> Excuse me, this hesitation here. Work my way out. <laughs> 
takes a little bit of work. You can see that my undersleeves are a separate piece. And Kate is going to help me by removing the bodice and all the other pieces. So you can see that I've got a corset under here, which of course helps create that shape for the bodice. Uh, human bodies are soft and lumpy, and they move when we breathe, which is not very good for a woven top. Uh, so if I were to breathe and move and not have this support underneath, that bodice could never fit as smoothly as those fashion illustrations uh, demonstrate. And, and ideally, if I were uh, a, had a fantastic seamstress, that would fit me like a second skin. And so it would be absolutely necessary to have this support. I'm going to read you just a, a quick bit here um, about uh, the bodice and the importance of the corset. They could be those bodices could be pulled on tight, like I said, looking like a second skin. So uh, here from a, a piece from 1853 called Dress Reform. The author says, women often say to me, my dress is not tight, it is perfectly loose, taking up a fold in front, pulling it away from their body. Any waist, however snug, may be taken up in that manner, for unconsciously the breath is held while doing it, making the chest smaller. The only way to ascertain whether a garment is too snug is to undo the fastening, stand erect, fully inflate the lung, taking care to fill the lower part of them too, and rehook it. Tried by this rules, and it is the only true rule, not one dress in 50 will come together within two to four inches in front. So you can imagine, I think every one of us is squeezed into a pair of jeans that is too tight, pulling that bodice on every day, as snug as snug can be. I think those of us who lived through the 80s remember the tight jeans particularly well. There are a few other layers that go into it, and I'm also going to give you a quick look at my skirts. Now, a lot of us are familiar with the cage crinoline or hoop skirt. This actually, this 1852 time period, precedes the hoop skirt by about five or six years. Um, and so we're dependent on petticoats. Now, I have just a few layers on today. I didn't go to the full extent. I actually have an additional one or two petticoats I can add on under this. Uh, but this is heavily starched. Uh, traditionally, you would take uh, a starch in water. Um, you can get powdered starch and pour it into water. And you, you make this cotton as stiff as paper, almost. It takes quite a lot of time to keep it up, to keep it clean. Um, and to keep it to that papery consistency. It even rustles when you move, which was considered part of the appeal of having a woman around. It's listening to her rustle in and out of rooms as she hobbles around in that big costume. Uh, so I have another illustration of a petticoat. You can see they could be very decorative. But if you think about the fact that we're wearing two or three or four of these, they can be very heavy. Now, they also have to help create a shape. To get that perfect dome top, you really need to add a little bit at the top. This is called the tournure. And I have a tournure today on that is not wire frame like this, but is actually quilted cotton. And you can see just under her petticoat, there's a little lump behind. She may even be wearing a bum pad, which I am. It's basically a little pillow tied around my waist, shaped like a half moon. And all of these things are necessary to create that fashionable silhouette. It gives you the social power to interact with the people around you and, and earn the kind of respect that many people, not all, that, uh, that many women, not all women, but many women were seeking to, to gain. So there's a lot of incentive for wearing this costume, this, this clothing, that could be very uh, uh, inconvenient just simply for functioning, make daily function very challenging and really limit your abilities. So why were women like the dress reform, uh, women in the dress reform movement and women in the women's rights movement stepping away from fashion in order to dress uh, more like this in a practical outfit? Um, you've heard some of the bits of how cumbersome the outfit can be. Um, even in the newspapers, male reporters were complaining about women walking around in the streets in their long dresses, picking up trash as they went. And, of course, women's rights reformers were thinking about it at a little more deep level. 
Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote to her friend Lucretia Mott and said, depend upon it, Lucretia, that women can never develop in her present drapery. Uh, so they saw the implications of this dress on their long-term prospects and the rights that they wanted to achieve. So they started to look elsewhere. Um, one of the inspirations that they had was the women uh, who were Haudenosaunee, uh, who were living in New York State. We can see a illustration of a Seneca woman here, uh, next to a woman in a bloomer costume. See the Seneca woman, this is a woman in a bloomer costume. And you can see the inspiration. Uh, the Seneca woman is wearing a loose tunic, and she's got loose fitting pants on the bottom. And this is an outfit that allows her to work in the fields, to work around the home, and to be unencumbered as she cares for her family, and cares for her children, and cares for her responsibility. Um, many women's rights reformers in New York State, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Elizabeth Smith Miller, who we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, um, were friends with women from the Haudenosaunee Nation and um, were certainly inspired by them. They also looked at um, women from other reform movements. So the Oneida community had communities in Oneida, New York, and also in Vermont, and in Connecticut, and New Jersey. And John Humphrey Noyce, who was the leader of the United Community, declared, women's dress is a standing lie. It proclaims that she is not a two-legged animal, but something like a churn standing on casters. I'm referring to a butter churn there. You can see the, you can imagine the resemblance with the fashionable dress. Um, so in 1848, three women at the United Community adopted a shorter dress with trousers underneath. Um, they were constructed a little bit differently than a lot of the bloomer costumes that the women's rights reformers ended up wearing. Um, but achieve the same results, and you can see them at work here. Um, they also looked to the water cure movement. And in the water cure movement, there was an emphasis on physical health, health, physical fitness um, for both men and women. And um, there they said that standard fashion forced our ladies to totter and hobble along like a cripple or a fettered criminal. They felt that women invert chains by their fashion. Um, so they too adopted a short dress with pants underneath, um, which they called by numerous names. They called it the American dress, the Turkish dress, the Camille costume. Um, so there's all these different names that come about. Then we come to Elizabeth Smith Miller. And Elizabeth Smith Miller is the cousin of Elizabeth Cady Sam, uh, daughter of the abolitionist Garrett Smith. She was an avid gardener. She was fairly active in her life. And she was frustrated with fashion as well. She was frustrated with the way her skirts got in the way. And so she decided that she too would adopt a short dress over loose pants. And Stan, Elizabeth Cady Stanton actually wrote about Elizabeth Smith Miller for the newspaper The Lily. In March of 1851, she said, she slipped her neatly turned foot and ankle into a masculine boot, leapt into a pair of Turkish trousers, and walked forth a mile and a half through sleet and snow to the home of her childhood. There, having received the parental nod of approval, she shrinks not now from encountering the vacant gaze, the vulgar laugh, and the idle jeers of ill-bred men, women, and children. Um, so she's saying she's getting jeered for what she's wearing. It's not, not normal, um, but she's also very pleased at the um, comfort that it affords her. And Elizabeth Smith Miller ultimately wore the bloomer costume for seven years. So then, um, that was the first article that appeared in The Lily, a newspaper run by Amelia Bloomer, the first newspaper written um, by a woman, and for women, uh, that came out of Seneca Falls. And shortly after, in July of 1851, uh, 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 engraving was published of a Bloomer costume in The Lily. Unfortunately, most of what we know about the bloomer costume comes from these images and these written accounts. 
There are very few extant examples. This is the only complete one. Um, and this actually comes from Portland, New York. It was uh, belongs to Bariba uh, Carpenter. We don't know too much about him, unfortunately. It was found in a chest in a bank. But it is really wonderful to have this actual example uh, to see. And it's interesting to see, much like my own costume, the skirt is pretty long. It still, to modern day eyes, looks long and cumbersome, um, but so much shorter than what was popular at the time. Did you have any other details you wanted to add about about the about the costume? <laughs> um, well, I'll remove my mask again so that I can speak a little more clearly. Uh, let's see. We can talk a little bit more about petticoats. Ashley mentioned. Uh, petticoats and, and long skirts drive, gathering trash in the streets. And it's hard for us to really imagine that. Uh, but I don't know if anybody out there, again, going back to jeans, uh, because that's a, an item of clothing that a lot of us have experience with. I don't know if any women out there experienced jeans in the 90s. And it was the 1990s, it was very fashionable to have your jeans come all the way to the ground. And I had a fantastic pair of Levi's stovepipe jeans. They were straight leg, they went all the way to the ground, and I wore them to New Orleans. Mardi Gras. That was not a good idea because as you walked through the rain or whatever's left in the streets at Mardi Gras, it begins to get whipped up the fabric and you actually pull all of that, that filth and that, that uh, moisture and everything else up from the streets, from the actual streets. And remembering that 19th century streets uh, trash removal is not what we experience today. Many women who are living in rural situations are not, of course, seeing any sort of garbage removal and maybe moving through areas crowded with animals. Certainly in, in urban situations, in cities, women were moving through areas crowded with animals, with horses, with pigs, with dogs. All of that filth and rubbish is being uh, left in the streets and, and moving about, experiencing its normal state of decay. And as they move through the streets, those long skirts beautifully hung to the ground for us fashion, or for we fashionable women, barely showing her toes as she walks, are pulling up that filth, are pulling up that moisture, and sucking it all up to about knee level in some cases, depending on how moist it is that day. And so if you imagine these white petticoats, many of which, mine is, uh, happens to be hung a little bit short because it is an under petticoat, many of which are coming down to ankle and toe length, are white. And white shows that I have the wealth and the ability to maintain this challenging fabric, to keep it clean, uh, even when I'm dragging it through that filth. So it can uh, cause a real challenge um, in maintenance um, and in health, if you can imagine pulling that filth in and keeping it around against your body. So then the... Uh, so as dress reform kind of goes through its ups and downs, uh, 10 years later, we, in the 1860s, 1860s, we start to see walking skirts as all of a sudden we recognize that this fashionable silhouette that came, that came in the 40s, all of a sudden our, our skirts need to hit the floor. In the 1830s, we were a little bit more flexible about, uh, flexible about that. Ankles were acceptable. Uh, floral length was not expected. But by the 40s, we pushed this to the extreme. Our skirts must hit the floor. In the 1860s, we go, oh no, women might like to do some physical activity. We're going to permit some walking. And so we're going to come up with walking skirts, which are short skirts, which come to, again, ankle length. We're recognizing that this floor length uh, hemline is untenable. It's not a workable situation. Uh, let's see. I have quotes, all, all, I could read to you for an hour and a half, but I promise I won't do that. Um, going back to corsetry and the challenges of corsetry. Corsetry, of course, prevents us from, from bending. I have uh, pieces of steel that run from here, from, from chest line, to just below my waist. And so I cannot bend uh, to pick anything up. I made the mistake today, it's an obvious mistake, I really should know better by now, of not putting my shoes on before I put my corset on. I had to get help, because to get down to my shoes requires quite an operation. Um, it, it's a bit of a challenge. So this is impeding uh, even regular sitting. Lots of us throw ourselves down on a nice, soft, comfy couch, and our back kind of bends in all sorts of ways when we lean back. That does not happen, of course, I have to tell you. Uh, it is all neat and tidy, perching at the front of your chair with your back very straight, and uh, for fashion sake, your shoulders back. 
rolled shoulders, as I tend to say, is not an acceptable way to uh, acceptable way to sit for a lady. The stays is another word for the corset. So I have an 1852 quote here. That the stays are the basis of feminine attire. Most of the other habiliments of clothing are fastened to them, and to a great extent, they govern the shape and appearance of the rest of the dress. Governing the shape of the appearance of the rest of the dress takes a little bit of imagination, but if anybody can imagine uh, the change in shape of brassieres over the years, we all have uh, chuckled at 1950s images of brassieres and the bullet bra and all, and Madonna, of course, brought it back in a very exciting way in the 1980s. Um, but of course, if somewhere is to put that on today and wear that under modern clothing, we are, to some extent, aware of the change in body form. So this helps to build the foundation that shapes my clothing and creates that fashionable silhouette. Uh, they do impede our breathing. So you can see me breathing pretty comfortably, to be honest. Uh, I, I could have raised my course a little bit tighter today if I were uh, feeling ready for the vanity, which some days I am. Um, but in general, they force you to breathe across the top of your chest, not down through your diaphragm. I'm not having much of a challenge today, and you get used to it. You wear these day in, day out, and you don't think about it too much to the, to the extent that women were not aware of the uh, imposition on their body. Uh, I have a, another dress reform uh, piece published in 1856 called Health and Beauty, Corset and Clothing. The delicacy of the intercostal muscles, the falling of the breasts, the spreading of the frame at a certain period of life all call for support. And, can, and call for it in a manner that must be attended to. So say, oh, even though we're, we'd like to, we're getting older, our bodies are changing, we really need to, to create some form here. Um, so, so you can see these are creating an impact on people's bodies that they may or may not be fully aware of. Um, so although we are not positive about how dress, uh, women who adopted dress reform kept or discarded their corsets, we do know that it was very challenging to discard them. It was difficult to keep them, it's difficult to discard them. We know that women were wearing their corsets starting in their teenage years, and it depended on your family, it's like getting your ears pierced, it can be something that varies from family to family. Some families are willing to pierce their children's ears at five, others make their kids wait till 13, 14, 15, 16. So uh, corsets could be put on your, your, your daughters anywhere between 11, 12, it's a little early, um, but generally by 18 and 19, women are wearing corsets. So their muscles are not supporting their bodies from that, from that period forward on a daily basis. All the steel boning is the back support, it's a back brace. I'm wearing it every day to help keep me erect. It's very convenient. It's, I think it's comfortable, it seems good enough. Well, all of a sudden you take that support away and your muscles kind of go, what just happened? Uh, so it became very exhausting. There are texts uh, encouraging women. There are texts encouraging women to get rid of their corsets and um, and saying, "Hey, you can do it. You can do it." Most women give it up after you know, give up and go back to their corset after two days of trying without. But you can make it through if you keep on pushing through. Do I have a question? Oh, I thought I got a hand gesture that said question. Um, so you can, you know, they were encouraging each other. You can make it through. So there's plenty of reason to suppose that some women who adopted the reform dress may have been uh, adopting it in stages, may have chosen not to get, forego their corsets as they adopted this new dress. Um, also, there's a great deal of emphasis on the shape of the female torso, both then and now, and to simply abandon that means changing your personal uh, view of yourself and your view of your body. So it could be very different. Anything else to throw in there? Oh, shall we talk about the downfall of the, the bloomer costume? I almost dropped it. <laughs> uh, well, so women's rights reformers, um, there was a flurry of talk about bloomer costumes, and they were quickly picked up by women across the country in the 1850s, um, in 1851 specifically. And first, there was a really positive reaction. Uh, we have these two great sheet music covers from the collection of the New York State Library both uh, sheet music about the bloomer costume. Um, but very quickly the opinions turned. And soon the bloomer became used as a weapon. Um, it became a symbol for the way that women wanted to turn all of society on its head, at least in the opinion of people who did not want women to vote. So 
here you can see a caricature of women in super short skirts, uh, way shorter than any real woman who wore a bloomer. And they're smoking and they're hanging out on the street corner. Um, and they are just being completely uncouth. And we have another one, the house and the home turned on its head um, by a suffragette. Um, that is a derisive term for a woman who wanted to vote in the US suffragist. Um, but here we have a suffragette who's forcing her husband to keep the house, do the cooking and cleaning and watching the children. And she is too, is wearing a super short bloomer costume. Um, so these are all really negatives. And eventually women's rights reformers um, started to drop one by one, drop wearing the bloomer costume. Not because they didn't want to wear it anymore, um, but because, as Susan B. Anthony said, the attention of my audience was fixed upon my clothes instead of my words, a uh, problem that women today can totally relate to. Um, so they start to drop it. Uh, wearing a, a bloomer costume could be a very difficult thing to do. As Elizabeth Gay Stanton saw, her father did not support her, her husband did not support her in that endeavor. Um, Susan B. Anthony wrote once she lost the bloomer costume, her petticoats have assumed their former length and her wardrobe cleared of every short skirt. I am sorry, but still feel a great deal of sympathy for her. She stood all alone without father, mother, sister, brother, or husband. She imagines now she will be left prosecuted by them all, but I tell her that the dress is not a matter of trouble to them. Her altruisms will become more obvious to them. Everyone who drops the dress makes, makes the task harder for the few that are left. Um, and they still, even though they're dropping the dress, they're still talking about the ways that women's clothing is restricting them, that they're never going to have the freedoms. But they also realize at the same time that they need to focus their message. They need to think about what they want to achieve first and what things might take away from that and what will help them reach their goals. So ultimately, they coalesce around the right to vote and they hold off on dress reform for a while. Uh, ultimately, they will push back at that. Uh, meanwhile, there is a separate dress reform movement. There are women, uh, especially here in New York State, uh, based in Middletown, who continue to fight for dress reform. And to them, they see the women's rights reformers as taking away from their message that dress reform is the most important thing. Um, so in um, Middletown in the 1870s, the Dress Reform Association continues working. Uh, there's a newspaper called The Sybil, a review of the tastes, errors, and fashions of society that continues to be published by Lydia Sayer Hasbrook into the 1860s. And they continue to push for the idea that dress reform is, of course, important to achieve. Do you have anything more to add? I don't think I do. <laughs> do we have any questions? Well, thank you all for joining us. I do encourage you again to take a look at the New York State Museum's website and the educational resources we have available there. Some of the images that we showed you today are in that um, lesson plan on dress reform, um, so you'll be able to see them up close and really get a better chance to examine them. And thank you for joining us. <laughs>